Afternoon, everyone. Hope you're enjoying Cisco Live so far. Um, so what we're going to cover in this session today is we're going to start a little bit about what we are seeing in uh, hybrid and multi-cloud, what that means for your application and workload management. And so Danny Winokur and I'm going to cover that together. And then what are the expectations of your network as a result of that? And we have our celebrity guest, uh, Sachin Gupta, here. He's a He's the SVP product management for Intent-Based Networking Group. He asked me not to embarrass him, and I said, sure, I won't, but, <laughs> but welcome. Um, so let me start with kind of what the landscape looks like. And I picked about five areas or five key data points that I thought were absolutely relevant for us. So the first one as we think about this is it says, in two years, there's going to be about 50% in terms of application growth. Now, when you think about this, a typical enterprise has about five to 7,000 applications. So that means there's another 2,500 applications that will be added in the next two years. The second thing, one talks about the fact that 50% of your current applications are going to change. They're either going to be migrated, refactored, retired. So if I go back to what a typical enterprise looks like, that's another 2,500 applications. When you come to the third one, you know, we all know applications are modular, they're distributed. Last year, they had about eight dependencies. This year, that's 20 dependencies. We can all have a pool going in terms of next year when we're here, you know, how many more dependencies that would be. And then when you look at what developers are favoring, they strongly favor developing their applications in a container environment leveraging more of a hybrid environment in terms of getting the ability to be able to develop your apps anywhere and deploy them anywhere. And the last stat talks about the fact that close to 60% of compute and storage will be at the edge and the provider data centers. Being in IoT as well, I look at the edge as the IoT edge because as we're connecting far-flung enterprises. Think about your refineries, your ports, your roadways, your mines. A lot of data that's being generated there has to be computed there if you want near-time business insights. You're not going to take that back to the cloud. So I'm not surprised that in the next two years, this is what we'll see. Now we can debate and, and discuss whether this will be two years or three or even happen next year, but the reality is that's where our lives are kind of moving to. So let me net it out in terms of, you know, what does this mean for us? Clearly, the application dependency map is getting a lot more complex. And we'll talk about that in terms of a little bit later and how we're handling that. Your world is also getting a little bit complex because you look at it and go, geez, my security policies have to follow my application. How do I ensure that I do that? So when you look at this multi-cloud world and this hybrid world, it's, going to, it's increasingly more powerful because all the capabilities that you can leverage, but the complexity also comes along with that. And what does hybrid and multi-cloud mean? Because in many ways, when I talk to, to all of you, it kind of means different things to different people. Right? When you think about what is multi-cloud, I'll explain as to how we think about it. Multi-cloud is a business imperative. Because your applications, your lines of business want to be able to leverage innovations in multiple clouds. It could be a private cloud, it could be a public cloud. So I want Office 365, I want Amazon's Alexa, I want Google's TensorFlow. That's a, a business decision. Then when you get to hybrid cloud, hybrid cloud is more of a technology imperative that's in service of this business imperative. So how do I now have to manage and make sure that my apps are delivering the best user performance across this distributed hybrid world. And the reality is that hybrid apps are here to stay. I mean, when you think about it, you have your, you can have your front end, which is a catalog that's sitting in the cloud. You have your back end sitting on premises because your data, sometimes your credit card information is actually sitting on premises. Data locality and data gravity is real. It's not a one-off thing. 
And it's not just for GDPR compliance, nor just for security and, and, uh, or privacy for that matter. Those things are absolutely important. But from a business imperative standpoint or a business decision in terms of what you do, in terms of what you want to maintain control over your environments as well, data gravity is absolutely real. So how do you deliver that consistent user experience? And if you heard David Geckler talk about yesterday, is your network has to evolve because your existing infrastructure is not going to just completely go away tomorrow. So how do you actually deliver the same user experience anywhere, anytime, across any cloud? Those are some of the challenges that we're going to talk about in terms of saying you need to have a common, consistent, secure network across all of these environments. So how do you extend what you have on-prem to the cloud? You need to be able to look at the tools that you have and say, how do you extend that into the public cloud? So when you look at this slide, it's like, you know, in many ways you're saying, hey, on the left you have your on-premises environment, right? You have complete control over that today. You can, you know, there's a lot of applications you deploy on that today. On the right is the public clouds and the vast amount of innovations and new stuff that your developers are absolutely need and, and and that keeps you know, adding on. It's not a static world. It's a very dynamic world. So how do I leverage what's in that environment as well? But the thing you're thinking about is I want to be able to extend into this environment to be able to still have the same consistent networking and security policies on-prem. I want to be able to extend that into the cloud. And Sachin's going to come up a little bit later and talk about that. I have a set of tools that I use today in terms of app and workload management. Is it possible to extend those into the cloud as well? Because at the end of the day, I am still responsible for delivering that near perfect or perfect end user experience. And, and Danny's talked about before in terms of the implications to your business, both top line and bottom line, when your applications don't deliver kind of the experience that users are, are expecting, which, by the way, is, is dynamic as well. And how do you do this in a, in a consistent way, centralized, you know, where you have central management and you provide production-grade experience? So we're going to start with Danny Winokur to start talking about how do we do this from an app and a workload management. I'm going to come up back a little bit later, and then we're going to hear from Sachin. So let me invite up Danny Winokur. Thanks, Liz. All right, so as Liz said, um, things start with the application, right? That's the part of the stack that is actually closest to delivering business results in the digital world in which we're now living. And the application, therefore, has to deliver this seamless, flawless experience that is going to be fantastic for users. And the reason it has to do that is that the bar has been set incredibly high in all of our individual expectations, right? It's been now a number of years that each of us as individuals, whether we're working as an employee, in that context, our role as an employee within a business, or whether we're representing, our, rep representing ourselves as a consumer and buying products and services. In both cases, we've become accustomed to the experiences that have been pioneered by what I would describe as digital native design-led organizations, the Googles, the Facebooks, the Ubers of the world, that have set these expectations that we just have to have apps that are beautiful, they're simple, they're extremely responsive, they're fast. And the companies that have figured out how to master the art of creating those applications are the ones that are the winners competitively in this economy, whether those applications are being delivered internally to run their business or whether they are being delivered externally to their own consumers. And so, we see that represented in data from the App Attention Index that we conducted a few months ago. You can see that the data comes back and says, hey, 49% of survey respondents switch suppliers due to a poor digital experience. 63% are actively discouraging other friends and colleagues from using a service or a brand if they don't deliver a great digital experience. And 48% of all downtime incidents, each cost over $100,000. And we go into many organizations that are trying to make this kind of a digital transformation, 
and they're having outages as they go through the transformation that occur multiple times every week, sometimes multiple times every single day. And those dollar numbers don't account for the dramatic costs that are harder to account for, things like reputational damage, being in the newspapers, customers getting angry and saying bad things about you as suggested by the other statistics, right? So this experience is how you compete and win and when it goes wrong, it's going to be incredibly expensive and this is driving pressure onto IT teams and in particular onto both application and infrastructure teams because they are having to adapt the way they work and the technologies that they use in order to keep pace with the speed of digital business. Because in a world of experience where that's your competitive currency, two things are true, right? One is the business is now encoded inside the application and the application has to be able to get updated at the speed of business initiatives, which is very different than the past. And number two is we know that executives sitting in conference rooms do not succeed in coming up with the winning experiences. Winning experiences are achieved by doing user research, forming hypotheses, implementing in code, putting in production, and getting real-time telemetry and feedback that allows you to learn how your users are experiencing your application so that you can reform your hypothesis, recode, and get back into production. And the faster you iterate through that cycle, the more shots on goal you get and the more quickly you arrive at the winning experience. Right? Both of those things put pressure on velocity, and one of the things you need in IT to have velocity is to decompose monolithic applications and monolithic infrastructure into cloud and microservices technologies that allow smaller teams to move with autonomy and velocity in moving forward your application initiatives, right? And so we see the adoption of cloud and microservices on top of the three prior generations of technology that have made up IT, mainframe, client, server, and the web. And the result is that we end up in very complex hybrid environments. They look something like this. Because the reality in any mature organization is we can't throw away the three prior generations of technology. So most IT estates have all four generations represented, and there are strategic decisions that need to be made about which areas do you prioritize for cloud and microservices. That's going to often be the front end components of the application where you need that highest velocity of iteration. And you're going to accept the fact that you're still going to have web, client, server, and mainframe technologies in some organizations that are providing middleware and data access on the back end, oftentimes running in on-premises environments, traditional data center environments, alongside more recent cloud innovations that could be running on-premise in the private cloud or as instances or workloads in the public cloud, giving you the breadth of the multi-cloud estate. So what AppDynamics does in this environment is we monitor business transactions, right? You heard me talk about this at the keynote if you were there. It's basically a lens through this complex multi-cloud application environment that focuses on a key outcome for the user through that application estate. And what that does is allows you to simplify monitoring instead of having all of these alerts for all the technical components that make up this complex estate, you actually abstract it up to an, an outcome for the user inside the application that puts it in context. And what that does is allows us to figure out when something goes wrong, where it's going wrong, what, what does it impact, how does it matter, and therefore how can we prioritize it and fix it. Now, um, oh, oops, there it goes. Okay, so in this example, it shows a network policy change that is root caused into the data center. And then you can say, okay, I understand it's affecting this particular business transaction for this application, and I can now go ahead and fix it. One of the things that's powerful about what AppDynamics does is that we also correlate the business transaction and what is going on in the application to the business impact it is having as measured by business metrics, right? And so you now have the ability to not only look at your key performance indicators for the technology performance, but also for business performance so that you can understand who is affected, how many dollars are invested, what are the common SKUs that are being put in the cart, what are the checkout abandonment rates. These are the things the business cares about, and so you can use that to prioritize your work. At the same time, we've announced a new feature 
that we announced on stage yesterday, which is the experience journey map. And this is the third lens that AppDynamics gives, which allows you to now place into context of the actual front end screens that the user is going through the full application experience. So you can now say, OK, I have my back end components. I have my business results. But I want to look at it through the screen by screen journey that is being mapped with AI and ML to show me those top journeys. And then in that journey map, I can see abandonment rate that connects me to my business data. And I can actually say technology performance and key performance indicators that point me down to further troubleshooting in the application. Together, these capabilities help organizations move from traditional operating models like this, where you have separate siloed business teams, development teams, and operations teams, into a model that looks more like this, where you have biz dev ops. Right? This is the notion that your separate teams need to work together with a new level of intimacy and collaboration that is going to allow them to accelerate the velocity of iteration that I talked about earlier, which is necessary to work up and down the stack to win in a world of digital experiences. Right? So that's fundamentally what AppDynamics does at the application layer. But the application layer is, of course, not where it ends. And as Liz pointed out, we're going to now begin to dive deeper into the infrastructure so you can see how we're connecting the full stack all the way down. And so if you now look at that stack and you say, OK, there's business, there's application, infrastructure, network, and security, you have legacy systems that the different operating teams at those different layers of the infrastructure have invested in. Those legacy tools tend to keep them siloed because they represent different data sets and different sources of truth that result in finger pointing when problems occur as they try to move in lockstep together to iterate and creating experiences. Right? So what we're working on at Cisco, and you're going to hear more from Sachin in a moment about some of this as well, is we are upgrading those legacy systems to create modern domain controllers that are software-defined, open interfaces for data exchange, and then beginning to connect the data sets between the tools so that each persona in the organization that is focused at a layer of the stack has the opportunity to work within their tool of choice where they're comfortable, but they're using connected, correlated data sets that represent a single source of truth and aid them in their collaboration. And so with that, I'm going to hand back to Liz, and then she's going to go to Sachin, and you'll sort of see how we dive into the infrastructure and connect these data sets from the application on down. So back to you, Liz. Yep. So I think if you watched the keynote yesterday, you saw how we talked about you know, how we're taking data sets from the infrastructure, the virtualization layer, and from AppD, correlating that to be able to create this view of a dependency graph so you know all the dependencies the application has in your, you know, across all those resources, whether that's on-premises or in the cloud as well. Interestingly enough, you know, when I finished the keynote, some of the feedback that came back saying, hey, that's a good on-premises tool. What do you guys do for the cloud? And I thought it would be good to emphasize that again in terms of what we're talking about is not just an on-premises tool, but it's a, it's a hybrid and it's a multi-cloud tool as well. So if you look at InterSide Workload Optimizer, which is what we announced yesterday as we did the keynote on main stage, I know there was a lot of stuff to consume in terms of what we talked about on main stage. But InterSide Workload Optimizer actually it, it makes API calls to pretty much every entity, which is what you can see in the circles on this dependency graph. And that's where it pulls all of this information in terms of the immediate dependency of each one of those entities, and then it correlates that and connects it and builds out that dependency graph. And so what you see out here is a dependency graph that's built for an application that, doesn't, that leverages resources that sits both on premises as well as in the cloud. It makes the same API calls to the multiple different cloud providers as well. And while one of the top use cases is usually about, you know, how do I predictively or proactively troubleshoot my application issues before it even impacts end users. The other application or use case example is also very much about how do I optimize my resources? Because most often than not, 
when I actually get um, my bill, it's sometimes a, a shock. And given that there's multiple, you know, I, if I take an example of an instance type, you know, these keep expanding or evolving every day, every week, every month, and you get a lot of choices out there. So how do I make the most optimal, you know, kind of uh, calls for my application? This is where things like the workload optimizer, you know, if you look at it, if I drill down on what's happening with the VMs, it'll actually show me that I can actually use different instance types. So if I click on one of those, it gives me very specific data in terms of going to another instance type and saving money. So I want to make sure that we re kind of introduce this today because we're talking about an app and workload management tools uh, between the two capabilities that you have here. That's not just for on-premises, but also works in a, in a hybrid multi-cloud environment, right? So as Danny talked about, between what we're doing with AppD and Workload Optimizer, we're helping break down the silos between the infrastructure operator and the app operator so that both teams have a common view of a shared data sets, and they're able to both proactively address tr performance troubleshooting issues as well as optimize resources. Now, the other thing that I talked about earlier in terms of, hey, most of developers prefer developing in a container environment, but mostly leveraging Kubernetes. So the ask from very much of our customers is, how do we provide an enterprise-grade container platform? And these are not easy to do, and this is what we released the Hyperflex application platform for. Because when you're talking about an enterprise-grade container platform leveraging Kubernetes, I think many of you know Kubernetes is not just one thing. You can take your upstream Kubernetes. You still have to bring that together with a number of components, sometimes 20 or more, in terms of you have your logging, your monitoring, your registry, you have your container networking plugins. You have a container storage uh, plugins. And you've got to pull all these open source components together, test it, and make sure that you actually keep up with all the releases, which, by the way, for open source, that comes in every day, every week, every month. And that's exactly what we're doing with the HX AP platform. What it does is it helps bridge two worlds. IT and DevOps, where IT can now be offering this as a container, as a service. And for the developers, it provides a world in terms of where you can, you know, as I talked about, 70% of them actually prefer to use containers in a hybrid environment. You're now providing the ability to actually develop anywhere and deploy anywhere as well. So I wanted to make sure that we, we actually comprehensively talked a little bit more about this, and you can go see this in, in the world of solutions and our launch zone as well. All right, so let me now segue to, to the networking part of it. And uh, actually, before Sachin comes up, um, I wanted to mention quickly a, a conversation I had with a customer of mine, if you, if you don't mind. Um, we were talking about how IT needs to evolve uh, or is evolving to a cloud world. And, uh, my customer was saying, look, I have applications today in VMs and in containers as well. In fact, I use my resources across different regions, and I have multiple accounts for the same cloud provider. Right? So I need, I need a common secure network to be able to manage all this communication back and forth so I don't have to think about, hey, you know, I have my application in this VM or this container, and how do I thread all of that together? So secure networking is what powers a hybrid cloud. That's totally in Cisco's wheelhouse. And I want to invite Sachin to come up here and talk some more about it. All right, thank you, Liz. Thanks, Sachin. All right, good afternoon. I'm going to try and bring this home in the next five or six minutes and talk about, just like Danny addressed, the complexity in the application environment and how all the products that Liz and Danny are bringing can help solve that. I'm going to talk about the complexity from a networking and security point of view and how Cisco's architectural approach helps solve that. So quickly, moving right into it, the world previously was very simple. I was using my WAN to connect my sites into my data centers, and internet was a best effort kind of use case. It was very, very easy to manage. And now you have this world that Liz talked about with multiple cloud providers 
more than 80% of our customers tell us that you're using at least two infrastructure as a service providers and paying for more than 30 SaaS applications, but maybe using more than 100 each. Right? So this is the new world that we're having to deal with where your applications, your services, need to be in many, many different places, and you need to figure out how you use a co-location or a carrier neutral facility as part of your design. If I zoom in and I show you this environment from a networking point of view, well, some things will look familiar. Like you're going to say, yes, I have subnets, I have peering points, uh, I have this notion of transit gateway, I have this notion of VNets, virtual WAN hub. In every single cloud provider, you're going to find different capabilities, different terminology, multicast, routing, ingress routing, Direct Connect, Express Route, lots and lots of differences that you need to now go in and manage. So this is not even bringing your sites into the cloud, but just connecting clouds to each other because, or connecting different regions within the same cloud provider. This is the new network complexity that you need to go manage. And so I really like this quote from a CCIE. I'm a CCIE myself. I've been doing networking for 23 years. And this is a quote from Ivan who says that when you look at traditional network engineers who look at AWS, for example, it's a little bit like Alice in Wonderland. Everything seems similar, but it doesn't feel quite the same. All right? And how can we, as Cisco, help you navigate this new world? So what we do is, first of all, we follow an architectural approach. With Cisco Secure Cloud Scale SD-WAN, we want to make sure that regardless of where your users are connecting from, what kind of transport is being used, MPLS, 5G, 4G, it doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter where your application environment or your services reside, we can deliver automation, analytics, security, and application optimization in a consistent way. And we can't do this alone. We have this architectural approach, but the partnerships are extremely critical to make sure that the solutions work end to end. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the Amazon, the Amazon and Microsoft partnerships. But on this slide, let me mention our partnership with Equinix. If you need to bring up a rack of services in a co-location facility at Equinix, we can fully automate how you get traffic in and out, extend the SD-WAN fabric, as well as do service chaining in that environment. And that's the partnership with Equinix. And looking a little bit more at what we're doing with Amazon and with Microsoft, first off with AWS, you can now take the benefit of their transit gateway and transit VPC and extend the Cisco SD-WAN fabric into AWS. So secure connectivity and a path preference that you can drive all the way into AWS Cloud. At the same time, you can use Cisco ACI for application policy to provision in the cloud, or if you're bringing an instance of AWS on-prem with outposts, the same ACI Anywhere solution can manage application policy on-prem. And then last but not least, from a security point of view, you are able to go ahead and use Cisco Defense Orchestrator to manage your firewall instances that could be virtually in the cloud. And you can use StealthWatch Cloud to detect threats in your cloud environment. So let me just step back. Your SD-WAN solution, which was previously can just connect sites to your data centers, can now extend into the, cl into the cloud environment. Your ACI solution, which was on-prem data center, now can manage cloud the same way. And your security offers can now be in the cloud the same way. So all of the products and tools that you're familiar with, you can now consistently apply them in a cloud environment. If I move to the Azure relationship, very, very similar to what we're doing with Amazon, the ability to take the SD-WAN fabric and extend it so that you can use virtual WAN, you can use a virtual WAN backbone, and implement consistent set of services with Azure. And then very interestingly, we're also partnering with the Office 365 of the house with Microsoft. With Office 365, if you read their documentation, they talk about, you know, don't use anything else. Come directly to my backbone for Office 365. Well, maybe you're using an internet connection from your branch to connect to O365. But that may not be the best performing all the time. At some times, you may need to use your MPLS circuit, or you may need to go over your backbone to your headquarters, uh, or through a co-location facility in order to get the best experience for O365, 
while maintaining security. And we give you auth automatic path selection by sharing data with Office 365 in the background. So if I bring it all together, we're helping you address those complexities on the application side or on the network and security side through consistent IT operations, IT consistency, same set of tools, innovation through an architectural approach, and through industry-leading partnerships. And finally, those partnerships are not just at the network level. Liz talked about bare metal VM container environments and partnering with the major cloud providers at that level. I've talked about networking and security. And Danny talked about what we're doing from an app management and workload management. Liz talked about some capabilities there as well. So the partnerships are for the entire stack that you need to manage. You can expect that we will continue to partner with the leading industry leading providers that you're working with in order to ensure that you can get the full benefit of the cloud and not have to deal with all the complexities. Thank you.